I'm so honored to be a part of it. Uh, and I, I, um, I kept sort of, if you saw me taking notes, I just kept sort of changing my mind about what I was going to talk about. That always happens to me. And I'm getting inspired by other people. Then I make a big mess and I can't read my own handwriting. Um, <laughs> But I was thinking about uh, a couple summers ago when I was in Louisiana uh, in the middle of the BP disaster. Um, I was there covering it, writing a story about that massive oil spill for The Guardian. The article was called A Hole in the World because that's really what that spill was. It wasn't a spill. It was a massive wound in the earth. Um, it's one of the saddest things I've ever seen to see that beautiful part of the world just absolutely fouled with oil. We were in Louisiana when the oil reached the coast for the first time. And that was a terrible day because that, was, that meant that the grasslands were coated in oil and that they were going to die. Um, and that grass really holds the land together. It's the root system. And it protects the land from hurricanes. Uh, and, and we were just watching, watching it die. And all around us, we were meeting people who were watching their way of life die. Fishing people, in particular. Um, native people. Uh, and they just had no idea what their future held. And the saddest part of it was that a lot of them had to go work for BP <laughs> to clean up the oil because it was the only job left. And this is what oil does. Uh, it, it doesn't just compete with other industries. It swallows everything until it's the only thing left. And then there's no resistance because you know, there's no tourism industry. There's no fishing industry. Everything's dead. And People just have to take those jobs. And that's why they call oil a curse. And people know all about the oil curse around this world. I mean, they know about it in the Niger Delta. They know about it in the Ecuadorian Amazon. They certainly know about it in Fort Chippen, where it gets us from. Um, but when it comes to the tar sands, there is a blessing that's hidden in the curse. And the blessing is that the tar sands are landlocked. And that that oil can't turn into money until it can reach the coast. Can't turn into the kind of money that they want. That they're sinking billions and billions of infrastructure uh, in order to translate that oil into money. They need these pipelines. They need these pipelines, these arteries as Tom Goldtooth, the head of Indigenous Environmental Network, calls them. And he says, we've got to block the arteries. We've got to give the tar sands a heart attack. Um, because they're carrying poison. They're carrying poison. Now, this is the thing about oil money. It's crazy money, and it makes people crazy. Um, and the people who are close to it lose all perspective. The people who are close to it, it makes them crazy. But the blessing that we have is that people living all along these pipeline routes haven't lost their minds yet. And they still understand that there are things more important than money. They, they still understand that water is more important than money. They still understand that it's more important to be proud of where you live and the relationship that you have with the land. And that's what's killing these pipeline projects. And you know, you hear these phrases from Alberta politicians and, and oil analysts. They talk about, about how Alberta is going to be landlocked in bitumen. You won't be able to get it out. Um, or they talk about how the oil sands are going to be stranded, stranded because they can't get it out. They have these projections. They're going to increase production threefold by, by 2020. No, they won't. Not if they can't get it out. Yeah. And that's what this is about. You know, I used to think that we were going to build a movement against the tar sands 
riding the infrastructure that they want to build, that their tar sands would build our, their, their tar sands pipelines would build our movement for us. They're building the pipelines, we're connecting with each other, we're meeting with each other, we're creating our coalitions. But now, after today, and watching this incredible coalition, this incredible movement, what Gerald Davis of the Heisel Nation, who's here today and who emceed the ceremony this morning, he referred to, to the movement as the magic canoe because it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> um, and I love that, I love that, that image. Um, you know, what's, what's happening here is, is surprising all of us, but it's not the infrastructure that's connecting us. I'm realizing this, and I, as I listen to the amazing speakers today, it's water. It's water that's connecting us. That's how we're meeting each other. We're following the water flows. We're following the salmon runs. And there's nothing more powerful than that, to build a movement based on the water that flows through us, that flows through our bodies, that flows through the land. This is a very, very powerful movement. This was indeed a gorgeous day. I felt so privileged to be in that room today, watching the signing ceremony, listening to the drumming, being here on the one year anniversary of the Save the Fraser Declaration. And so often First Nation land rights are treated in the corporate media as something that takes away from, subtracts from the rights of non-native residents, right? That's the way they play it in the media. It's a competition, us versus them, right? Yet what we can clearly see in these declarations is that the existence of First Nations title and rights and the courage that has been shown in upholding and protecting these rights for hundreds of years is not just about First Nations self-interest. It represents the best chance of protecting the possibility of a safe future for every single one of us. It is about It is about protecting a culture of life in the face of that culture of death that I witnessed in Louisiana and that is being held up under this idea that BC should be the gateway for the fossil fuel industry. And they are so upset because those gates aren't fully open. Now, First Nations in BC, as you all know, are under extraordinary pressure right now from the highest levels of government and corporate power to back down from their principled opposition to tar sands oil and accept all manner of deals. And there's a deep racism in the way this is discussed. You know, oh, what, they just, they're just waiting for their payoff. They're just waiting for, their, for, the, for, for, for a better price. And these beautiful declarations based on ancestral law you know, are treated as if they're nothing. You know, as if they're a bargaining position. That's racist. We need to respect these documents because they're legal documents. And we are so lucky to be here tonight with many of the First Nations leaders who, who have drafted these documents, who've championed these documents, um, who've carried them forward, as we heard, 61 signatories, now 130. All of our futures are bound up in this power. And I think it's time for everyone in this room to stand up and show our gratitude for the courage that has been shown. Because this is about protecting all of us. So will you please do that with me? Will you please thank all of the First Nations people who have been protecting struggle. And we also need to do something else. We need to commit to standing with you, not just in the fight against the tar sands, but standing with First Nations to protect Aboriginal title and treaty rights, 
that are under attack from governments claiming to protect the Canadian economy. Now this is happening at the provincial level, it's happening at the federal level, there is a whole new siege on, there's a divide and conquer mentality. And we need to understand that when we stand with First Nations people to protect their constitutionally protected rights, we are protecting ourselves. We are not in competition. This is My mother, Bonnie, my father, Michael, my brother, Seth, my niece, Zoe, so patient, so bored, doesn't look bored, amazing, <laughs> my husband, Abby, um, I don't know if people know this, but my whole family lives in BC, and increasingly BC is where I make my home, I know people think of me as a Torontonian. Um, BC is where my heart is, it's where my family is, it's where I write, it's where I'm inspired to write, it's where I'm inspired to fight. So many of us draw inspiration from the beauty of British Columbia. All of us who live here are nourished by the beauty of this province, by all of the creatures who surround us. We are so blessed. And I, I am really lucky to spend a lot of my time near the water, on the water, uh, on the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> and just a couple of days ago, I was actually working on the speech, doing some research. It was a rough day, um, and, and the water was, was looking particularly wavy. Um, and I was looking at it, and I suddenly realized, those aren't waves, those are dolphins. Oh. Um, there was this huge pod of 50 Pacific white-sided dolphins. They were moving so fast, they were making the water boil. Um, you know, and we took out the cameras and chased them around, do the silly things we do. Um, and of course, I thought it was maybe a message. I saw them again the next day. The last time I saw them was when Melina called me to tell me about the, the spill in Little Bit Buffalo. And I feel like these dolphins show up when we're fighting with pipelines. And I feel like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if they're trying to communicate with us. You know, I know that sounds really flaky. But I feel like they should be part of this discussion. I feel like they should be part of this discussion. I feel like they should have a voice at the table because they are dependent on those waters. And we know what they'd say. They'd say, stop the pipelines. We don't want the tankers. Leave our herring and salmon alone, please. That's yeah. much. Um, that's also reciprocity. We need to understand that if we are going to be awed by the beauty of BC, if people are going to make their living, selling, and trading off the beauty of BC, we have a responsibility to protect and defend and speak for those who don't have a voice at the table. A few days ago, I think the day before the dolphins showed up, Stephen Harper was visiting Vancouver, here to cheer for the BC Lions. He was also here to cheer for the Gateway Pipeline. He uh, made time in his busy schedule for that in this absolutely ridiculous interview that he did with Global TV. I don't know if you caught that piece of trenchant journalism. Um, it was actually incredible. You know, he, he came and he said that, that, this, that this project was of critical importance to Canada and threw his weight behind it. Um, and it's really worth pausing to appreciate how extraordinary that is for the Prime Minister of Canada to make a statement like that. I mean, this is a project that is still very much under review. The people of this province have not had a chance to speak in hearings against it or for it. We know that 130 First Nations, uh, an opposition grounded in Aboriginal title and rights, constitutionally protected, upheld by the highest court in this country, have come out explicitly against it and said absolutely no way. And we heard that again tonight. We know that that principle uh, 
that, that, that projects can't go forward without informed consent is established in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, recently adopted by the Government of Canada. And yet here is the Prime Minister disregarding all of this, not even going through the motions of what every politician does, which is, well, of course we have to wait until the review is over, right? Even though we know they don't really mean it. He doesn't even bother doing that. He doesn't even bother paying lip service to due process in any way. Now, this is the law and order prime minister, is he not? This is the guy ramming through a 150-page omnibus uh, bill. You know, this omnibus bill, this is a guy who just can't wait to build more prisons because he believes so strongly in the law. And here he is making a mockery of the law on every level. This is a lawless man. He showed his disregard for first nations rights for multiple Canadian court rulings. And let's not forget the Kyoto Protocol, because of course, oh. the UN Climate Summit is happening right now, and the Canadian God. government is in the midst of tearing that up, going to Durban, going to Africa, the continent most vulnerable to climate change, where climate change is being called a genocide, and saying, no, actually, I don't think we're gonna stick with the Kyoto Protocol. Shame. Why? Shame. Why? Oh, because. Apparently because the Kyoto Protocol does not include China. And our government thinks that if we're going to cut our emissions, China should cut their emissions. So it's not that we're against cutting our emissions. It's just that we want China to cut their emissions too. Right? Except for, yeah, yeah. Right? Except for we're going to, we really need to build this pipeline to send them the dirtiest fuel on the planet so their emissions can soar even further so they can make some more goods to sell at Walmart for us. Yeah, they're really concerned about China's emissions. <laughs> I think their goal is pretty clear. It is for a wild west. Um, yeah. It is for no controls on emissions either in Canada or China or India or anywhere. And all of this is just a smokescreen. Um, this is actually not a government. They are paid lobbyists of the oil and gas industry. Um, this is what our government does. They travel the world um, representing Shell and BP and, 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 and Exxon and, and Suncor. And, you know, they've spent a lot of time in Europe recently arguing that Europe should lower their environmental standards, should scrap a law that would require them to label tar sands oil as being dirtier than other fuels. And our government is busy using, teaming up with the UK government, which is also working with Shell and BP, um, to, to eliminate those laws. That's, that's what our government is doing. That's who they are. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Keystone. Because I have been involved in it, I, uh, you know, I was one of the, the, the signers of, of the, the original letter that went out, calling on people to come to the White House um, and commit civil disobedience um, to get arrested. I wasn't planning to get arrested. The Canadians were not supposed to get arrested. We had a deal. The deal was Canadians not arrested. It even said it in the letter: the Canadians don't have to get arrested. But then I got there, and Gitz was there, and he was like, "I'm getting arrested." <laughs> And so I went up and I wrote the, the, the and Avi was there, my husband, he was going, what, you said you weren't going to get arrested. Um, but anyway, it was Gitz's fault. <laughs> but I'll tell you, you know, when we, when we sent out that letter, we, we did not expect to get the kind of response that we got. We, we thought maybe, maybe a couple hundred people, not a couple thousand would, sh would sign up. 1,200 uh, 1, people were arrested outside the White House. And this Whoa. is why Gerald is right. It's a magic canoe. How did that happen in two months? Um, we also didn't think that we could win. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Um, you know, it was, we thought our chances were really, really slim. Uh, and it was a really smart campaign strategy to put Obama on the spot. Um, but, uh, you know, let's remember, of the three pipelines that Rex was talking about, Kinder Morgan, Gateway, TransCanada, what all the oil analysts agreed was that 
Keystone was the easiest, okay? It was, in the words of Stephen Harper, a no-brainer, okay? Kinder Morgan was the next easiest. Gateway was the really, really hard one, okay? Everybody understood that, that, that Keystone was the rubber stamp one, because look, they're Americans. They're just gonna take it, right? Um, and, and, and TransCanada, the company behind it, was so sure that they were gonna get a rubber stamp that they went and bought the pipe. Yeah. They bought the pipe before they had the permit, okay? And they're now having to spend more than a million dollars a day to store the pipe. It's rusting and fetal. You know, that they had their no-brainer deal, that they actually mowed the pipeline route. They were ready to go, okay? Um, they were so sure that they were going to win that they threatened all these ranchers with eminent domain. And apparently Texas, Texan ranchers don't like being threatened by foreign companies with eminent domain. And they really pissed them off. Um, but, okay, here's the point. Um, now they're turning around and going, Okay, well, if we didn't get Keystone, and they may still get Keystone, but right now we've got a one-year reprieve, and TransCanada has said that they can't deal with that. They've said, you know, this delay could sink our project, so that may well happen, and we want it to happen. Um, you know, one thing that Chief, Jack, that Chief Jackie Thomas said today at the press conference, there was a question from CBC, um, they, they said, well, well, what if Stephen Harper does it anyway? Um, and, and, and Chief Thomas said, I'll be in front of the bulldozers, and, uh, and I hope a lot of my neighbors will be there with me. Um, and let me tell you, I heard the same thing from people living up and down the Trans-Canada Pipeline route. Um, that, yeah, this could get approved after the election, it's possible. It's possible Obama will lose the election and Mitt Romney will approve it. It's possible Obama will sell out the environmentalists and, and approve it himself. But the point is that doesn't mean this thing is gonna be built because people are really, really mobilized now. Um, when we were at the White House um, a month ago, the, the, the action was to surround the, the White House. Um, and, and Bill McKibben said, you know, depending on how you feel about Obama, you can think about it as a group hug. Um, you know, just telling Obama that if he stands up to TransCanada, we're standing with you, um, or if you feel differently, you can think about it as a house arrest. Um, it's up to you. Uh, what I said is, I said, look, I'm from Canada. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to pretend the White House is the tar sands and that we have them surrounded. Because let me tell you, in BC, they're going to block it. Um, they know this isn't a done deal. They know this is not some easy plan B. We'll just switch the channel and we'll have gateway. They're bluffing, okay? This is the point. They're bluffing. They're bluffing because their entire business model, all of those billions sunk into infrastructure, all of their growth projections are based on a promise they can't keep. They cannot keep the promise of getting the oil out of Alberta. This is uh, Alberta Energy Minister Ron Leifert. He made this clear that their whole model depends on BC. He said, if we don't soon figure out how to get the product to Asia, the investment is going to dry up. Right? <laughs> President of Shell Canada said, BC is a real gateway, but the gate's not fully open for energy in particular. Let's keep it that way. That is their goal, though. Let's be clear. Their vision for BC is a wide open portal to Asia and the rest of the world for oil, gas, and coal exports, the very substances that are cooking the planet. So yes, this is about protecting BC coastal waters and BC salmon runs and those dolphins, but it's a far greater moral responsibility as well. BC is now on the front lines of the climate fight. We have a responsibility to save the planet from warming, and that means refusing to be that gateway, which will make it a hell of a lot harder to get that oil out of the ground in the first place. Now I wanna just end by talking about two talking points. Um, Two talking points that we're going to hear more and more of. Um, when Stephen Harper gave that interview to, to Global, um, he talked about um, how the opposition to Gateway is coming from American foundations. And American foundations are manipulating all of you. Um, you are puppets in their hands. 
Um, and of course, you know, there is no wingy right-wing think tank talking point that the Harper government will not adopt as government policy. Like, give them two weeks, right? So this has been floating around in the blogosphere, and now, lo and behold, it's coming out of the mouth of the prime minister. And it's absolutely ridiculous. He's saying that these US foundations um, are funding the anti tar sands movement in BC because they don't want the oil to go to China. They want it to go to the US, okay? <laughs> these are the same foundations that funded the Keystone fight as well, and they're actually against the tar sands. That's a big secret. They're against the biggest environmental disaster on the continent. These big environmental foundations are actually funding opposition to a huge environmental disaster. As well they should be, that's their job. Now, I don't think we should have any shame about this, you know. Most people aren't getting money from US foundations, some people are. The point is this, tar sands are a North American problem. It is, most of that oil is being shipped to the United States, and Americans have a moral responsibility to block it too. There is nothing wrong with a, a, a collaboration between Americans and Canadians to stop the tar sands. Nothing else will do. And listen, we are gonna be as international and as global as they are, and they better get used to it. talking point is one you're all familiar with, which is the idea that this is ethical oil. <laughs> it's like organic chicken. They literally say that. It's like organic, free-range chicken, um, free-range oil. <laughs> It'd be funny if it weren't so offensive. And they also say that it's, it, 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 Ezra Levant says that he studied the left, right? And, he's, and, he's, and, he, and he studied the fair trade movement and the, the anti-conflict diamond movement, and he's just adopted all of this language, right? So this is like you know, the anti-sweatshop oil, right? And he also says it's conflict-free oil, right? Unlike the oil from Nigeria, right? Um, or unlike the oil from Libya, this is conflict-free oil. Well, let's wait a little while. Um, if you think that oil is conflict-free, just try to move that dirty oil through BC. Thank you, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, um, so we're